to another episode of Power Move Makers. This series was created with a simple goal in mind, to bring to the table high-level executives, successful entrepreneurs, and just all-around inspiring human beings. To have deep dive discussions with them, not just about their successes, but more importantly, about the road that they traveled to get there. Please welcome a dear friend, old friend of mine, to this week's Power Move Maker series. This man, I don't, I don't even know where to start with his accolades because he has so many of them. <laughs> hip hop culturalist. Uh, uh, Appreciate that, bro. Man. You know, hip hop journalist. There, there's just so much. I've actually I'll heard him. I was re researching you, and somebody called you the Sean Diddy Combs of journalism. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's fitting. Please welcome <laughs> Day to on time. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> My man, Sean, that's what's up, man. Thank you, bro. I so appreciate that, man. Thank you. No, nah, um, when, when I was researching you, somebody wild, was like, bro. yo, this is Deshaun Diddy Combs in journalism. I was like, yo, that makes sense. He really is. <laughs> <laughs> yo, it's just wild. It's just like, I, I think like my, my career track as a journalist has gone in so many different genres, you know, like where I came in on, on the hip hop side, you know, through Vibe. And then when I went over to Double XL and Harris um, publications that that produces them, um, or at least back then, I was able to start my my King magazine run. And then we started a car magazine. And then it, we just started going into all these different lifestyle elements that was a little bit left the center of most hip hop journalists. And um, I, I've I've just been lucky in that way. You know, your career has been phenomenal. I, I guess I want to ask, and this is for anybody who's Thank watching, you. and I try to pose my questions as though I'm a person who really wants to get into your industry. First and foremost, did you see this? Like, you are right. an extremely important person. You're very successful. There are not too many people that are not in your contact base where you just can't pick up the phone directly and reach them. When you were coming up, even before you got <laughs> your first internship, did you see this day for Dayton Thomas? Wow, man. I, I was I was speaking on this the other day, man. I said that like I was dreaming about being within the industry and being with all these different movers and shakers, but I never really saw it to the degree that it reached and continues to reach. Um, just being able to speak to a Diddy or speak to a Jay or speak to someone in, in, in those kind of caliber levels, a, a, a Damon John or, or Shark Tank, like to be able to exchange ideas at any point. Uh, Andre Harrell, who helped me, you know, tremendously in my career. Um, I think about those kind of levels and those moments and I'm like, wow, man, like I was just that kid in Brooklyn looking at them on, on my wall, you know what I mean? And, and, and going to their events and just trying to, you know, studying through different magazines and, and stuff like that, just trying to get the insight to where if the opportunity arose, I would be ready to be able to have conversations with them, let alone work with them on, on, on different projects. Did I see it? I saw some form of it, but I never saw it this robust. Wow. You know, you just mentioned Andre Harrell. And I referred to you early in the conversation as a hip hop culturalist. Mm -hmm. Andre did so much for this culture, yes, hip hop, R&B. Can you tell me from your standpoint mm -hmm. what Andre meant to the culture and what he meant to you personally? Wow, man. What Andre meant to the culture, he, he, was, he was the blueprint on how to take hip hop and expand it to its current height. What we're experiencing now, he expanded that. You know, he worked with Russell Simmons. Russell was the bro. He helped him with Def Jam. Def Jam was about the essence of hip hop, the, the street, the core principles of hip hop, and being able to expose that. What Andre did was like, yo, I'm going to take it. I'm going to add the fashion element. I'm going to add the high level executive element. I'm going to add the street element on some flyness. And then I'm going to take that to the next level. And, and infuse that in the TV and film, you know, New York Undercover and things of that nature. The videos are gonna have a step above. We're gonna have like a classic thing where 
you know, those midday brunches and stuff like that. Like he brought that, like that, that, that certain level of elegance mixed with street, but he wanted it to still be black. He wanted it to still have our flavor to it. So that's what he did culturally. And, and he did it on, on, on an extraordinary music level, man, just to be able to not only be a uh, iconic music executive in his own right, but to bring along even more iconic, you know, executives behind him, as well as take the transition of an artist, say um, Heavy D, and make him an executive. You, you take a, a dope MC, make him a superstar artist, and then you also usher him into the executive ranks. That's, that's just beautiful. Now, that's just one person, you know what I mean? Right. And then on the personal side, when I got into the industry, he was, he was one of those guys that I always looked up to, I always respected. And when I was introduced to him, you know, he automatically was on some like, you know, check, he checked you out. He was like, all right, let me see if this kid got flavor. What's up with him? Then he would try to, he'll ask you a question and try to see where, where were you within the cool zone? Where, what, what was your demo? Were you the dirty backpack kid? Were you the like super cool club kid? What kind of, what kind of dude were you? And, um, I think at that point in my career, I was like really breaking a lot of artists in double XL. And he saw, he saw where I was going with it. And he helped me so much when I started King. Um, it, it was just like a, a amazing friendship and, and being an executive and ushering me in. No, he really was an amazing person, an amazing spirit. And I think he's done so much for this culture. And I'm so happy to see that um, people recognize his contribution. I, you know, obviously was a good friend of his, have known him for many years. So I totally understand what he meant to the culture, but to really see how people have given it up to him and, and you know, shared their personal experiences just like you just did, I, I, I was so happy for him. So he would be dearly missed by so many and his impact, Maybe. not just on um, hip hop culture, but on the world. That whole black excellence, ghetto fabulous, uptown. Oh, yeah. He, he really cemented that in the world. So he definitely did his thing. I remember, you know, Andre, he did it. He did it. Uh, uh, interview, yeah. um, and he was on one of these mainstream. I don't know if it was CNN or it, it was one of these mainstream outlets. And he was talking and he brought his whole ghetto fabulous vernacular to it. He was right. like, you know, we out there and we chilling in the Hampty Hamps. <laughs> I'm like, no, go ahead, Dre. <laughs> So that's just the kind of person he was. <laughs> the he the empty hands. There you go. <laughs> oh, man. But, you know, for you, I and that. I want to take a step back in your story. I know that you were um, born and raised in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. Brooklyn Zone. Then you do a yes. stint in Japan, if I have it correct. How did that come about, and how long were you out there? Wow, man, that that whole that whole time was just magical. Uh, my mom married my stepdad when I was 11, and um, he was ordered to go to uh, Yokota Air Force Base in Japan. He was in the Air Force, and my mom was like, "Yo, we are gonna pack up, we are gonna go." And I was like, I was just starting. I was about to start sixth grade. Um, it was wild, man. That was like that's this is like '86. This is like real Brooklyn. You know what I mean? Like. Crack is starting to come through in, in its in its form. It was it was about to be real, real for us. And um when we got to Japan, man, it was just like the illest culture shock because I'm going out to a place where, you know, like in Brooklyn, you you, you gotta have an exterior. You go out into the street, you gotta protect yourself. It's it's like it's whatever. You're gonna have fun with your people, but you know, you're always on point. Your tents, your your antennas up. In Japan, man, it was so like beautifully hospitable man it was just it was insane it would if you if it was like this sean if you were to mention a, a uh an accessory on someone like say if you like their bracelet or you like they change like oh that's dope they'd be like oh yeah here you go no <laughs> way but it was i'm telling you man it was so crazy they were like that not even on no rock <laughs> It wasn't even like, yo, give me that. And that. It was just, they were like, oh, this, this connects with you? Well, if this connects with you, here you go. So now we're connected because oh, now scary. I'm part of your story. It's, it's, like, it's like a cultural thing. It was so dope, man. And I learned, you know, um, 
how to how to ad- admire and honor someone else's presence. And that's how that's how they live. So that's why you don't really hear about a lot of violence and stuff like that out there. Of course, they're going to be people. But what they do is they honor each other's lives. And when you do that, you honor what they create. So in a creative space, if someone makes something, it's like, oh, you take the time to find out what that is. So that's why their art and their creativity and things are so so high in quality because they're looking at each other and bouncing ideas off and all that. But I was able to make lifelong friends, man. Like Facebook really kind of brought us all together again. And um, I stayed in contact with a lot of them before I even, um, before Facebook even came up. But once again, just like the cultural aspect of Japan, man, it opened my mind to, to different kind of creativity. And I'm, I'm forever, forever indebted to them out there. They were so cool. And I stayed out there from 86 to 89, the end of 89. So you're out there for three years. Three years, man, 11 to 14. Um, my, my, my mom, she took us to, to uh, Korea. We used to go shopping like for the Dapper Dan type suits. Uh-huh. So my uncles and all my cousins, they used to send me like uh, VHS tapes of Young TV raps, video music box. They used to send me like cassettes of Red Alert, Mr. Magic. Um, I used to get all the magazines sent to me. And that's where my love of magazines really kicked up because that was my only information packet. When I would get those, you know, you pair a double, um, a double, a, a word up or a black beat with all the different posters. And then you get to see the video and you putting all that together because you're not there for the essence of it. You know, so my love for it was a little bit deeper when I came home than all my friends and family because they were so used to it. Here I am an encyclopedia of hip hop facts because I was just reading and reading and watching and looking for little things. And it was just one of those, um, it was just an incredible time, man. You just took me back with that too. It was an incredible time, man, beautiful. That, that's such a great story. And it segues to where I was gonna go next. And you kind of took the words right out my mouth. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I get that, and I love the way you articulated it. You know, you're over there, you don't have it on a daily basis, especially mm-hmm. in the 80s. Hip hop is not what it has become. So you, every magazine, every VHS tape you get, you are studying that thing from top to bottom. All the way. I get that you fell in love with the culture. Where did your mm-hmm. love affair with writing start? Wow. I, I would have to say probably around that time because in addition to the magazines, I was also a big comic book head. So I'm getting X-Men, I'm getting, you know, X-Factor, I'm getting all these different, you know, mag, um, comic books. And then I'm being exposed to the Japanese mangas, which, which are like comic books, and they tell a story as well. And they start from the back, and you got to go to the front. Where I'll start from the front, and you got to go to the back. And it was just like the mind, the mind games of being able to see writing that can go this way and writing that can go this way and tell a story. Both of them telling the story, but in different directions. And then the different styles and stuff like that. So it started to make me think like, oh man, I could, I could marry my love of writing with my love of music and start critiquing in that way. And I must've been like, I must've been like 12 at the time. And then when I got back to New York and I started going to college out here, cause I, we did a stint in between coming back to New York in uh, New Mexico in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I was out there for like a year and a half. And once again, I wasn't all the way in New York, so my love had to continue. Now I, I, I'm able to see MTV. I'm able to see your MTV raps and incorporate it into my daily. And I just started leveling up in that way. Um, but the love started probably in Japan where I, where I started to see like my writing and, and what I love to write about come together. Okay, and this is an important question because there's somebody watching this Mm -hmm. who's going to be in a position. You, okay, I get the love affair, 100%. Yep. But me, I I know I went through this. I had a love affair with hip-hop. Yes. But I didn't see it 
as a career choice because it was non-traditional. It wasn't something Super. that, you know, you couldn't go to school. And, and at that point, I'm, I'm now I'm told that they have um, music industry as a major. But at, that, at the time I was in school, that was it was not even an option. So I'm just looking at this. It wasn't, man. Time, I considered it a hobby. But I never can say, and it, it was a hobby right. that I loved the most. Actually, you know, I'm 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 up on every single record, every single artist. I loved everything about the culture, but I never saw it, saw it as a career choice. For you, who now you're starting to marry your love of the culture with your mm -hmm. writing, mm -hmm. was it a seamless thing for you to see? Like, you know what? This is actually a career. Or wow. you start to go a traditional route and then back into the fact, like most people do, I know myself, like, you know what, what am I doing? Why am I searching for a traditional nine to five? Let me just follow what I love. Let me just follow my passion mm. because it is hip hop and it's music. Man, that is the best question. Um, I would have to say in high school, it was my English teacher, my advanced English teacher who was like, yo, you got something, man. You really should like hone this in because you got something. You're you're special with this, and I didn't necessarily think I was special until he said it, and and he made he made that inference. And then um, when I got to college, I was uh I was I started writing for the college paper. I thought it was corny at first because I used to read the college paper and be like, these dudes don't know nothing about hip hop. What they talking about? They start, they was trying to review records and stuff. And you know, I'm I'm a Brooklyn kid, and in high school, we used to always, you know, argue about who was nicer, Biggie, Jay Z, or Nas, or whatever you want to no. say. And um, you know, those debates, they, they what they do is they um they curate your thoughts on on your critique, you because now you gotta you gotta go back and forth against somebody that is a staunch, you know, Biggie fan. And then now, you know, you're a Nas fan. You got to be able to have those arguments ready. So I felt like some of the arguments and some of the stuff that they were writing in the college paper weren't all the way up, except for, like, this one dude who used to always do it. And then when he started doing it, and I, I started looking like, maybe I can be, like, one of those writers in the source. Maybe I can be, like, one of my favorite writers in, in, in Vibe. And that was my goal. I wanted to get to Vibe. I was like, yo, I'm going to get in that magazine at some point. And sure enough, we were only 10 blocks away. I called up and, and I, I cold called them, Sean. I cold called Bob. I saw the number on their website in 96. My man picked up my man, Greg Bishop, who's now the um, small commissioners. Uh, he's the commissioner of small business for New York City, which is wild with, with Mayor de Blasio. Yep. Uh, that's, my, that's my bro. Um, he he brought me on the team and I was with them for a year, no pay, no pay. And at the time I was also working, I just worked for like two years at the New York public library system. And I was teaching illiterate adults how to use uh, computers and learn how to read. So I was doing that for two years and there was this one individual there, man, my man, Mr. Larry Cook, I'll never forget him. Older gentleman, he was in like his mid fifties at the time, early fifties. And he hadn't learned how to read his whole life. And he used to see me walk in there every other day when he would come. And I would have a stack of magazines with me. And he would be like, man, you always reading the magazines, talking about you wish you was in there. I wish I could read like you. If I could read like you and write like you, I'd be in all of them. I'd be in every <laughs> last one of them. <laughs> and he was like, he was pushing me to go forth into what I wanted to do because as much as I was helping them, they were inspiring me. I love and it. when he said that to me, I was just like, wow, this man is saying if he had the simple tools that he's trying to acquire this late in life, if he had them in, at my age, which I was like 20 at the time, I was 19 when I started there and I was 20 when he told me this, he was like, I would be all in the magazine. You see Larry Cook everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I always, I try to mention him because it was at that moment when I realized like what's slowing me down. I have the tools. I just need to get in so I could use my tools. And um, he was very instrumental in, in stripping away whatever fear or whatever obstacle I thought was there. 
You know, okay, I got a couple of questions for you. I'm what ready. year were you in school when you decided to reach out to Vibe for this internship? Wow, I was in my I was in my junior year. You're in your junior year. I, I'm I'm in the end, yeah, I'm in the end of my sophomore going into my junior year. Yeah. Okay, so you're telling me it's not a, a college advisor, it's not a counselor on the campus. It is literally a guy who had never learned to read or write in his life that gave you the motivation to say, look, if he had the tools that I currently possess yep. at, his, at my age, he's telling me to yep. go for it. This was your motivate, like, yep. like in some ways, he was every bit of a mentor to you as you- Oh, no question. Yeah. No question, man. No question. I mean, the, uh, to be real with you, man, sometimes I miss those days and I'm, and I'm looking for ways to get back into that with the library system. I'm going to have a, a, a talk with some people over there. Uh, those two years that I was there, man, and the people that I was able to connect with just on a personal level, just hearing their stories and finding out why they were illiterate and, and why they didn't finish school and why it was, it, it was tough for them because some of them had you know, um, different kind of learning disabilities and stuff like that. And, and we would work through it. And, and a lot of it wasn't, this is what you do. A lot of it was just hearing them out, getting them to a, a place of trust where they would open up to be taught. And, you know, to be able to affect people's lives that way, you don't realize how much they're affecting you and how much they're teaching you life lessons on, on trust and trusting other people. And just and this is just in them trying to acquire a skill set that they need in everyday life. And once again, Mr. Cook, he was a truck driver. He couldn't even read the signs, but he was wow. a truck driver for like 20 something years. I'm going on to 30 years and he was able to go all over the all over the country just based off like different things that we don't enhance on because we already know how to read. So his interactions and, and, and the way that he could communicate verbally and just by facial expressions and stuff, you pick that stuff up from people. He was mentoring me in that way. He was giving me different kind of, you know, networking skills that helped me along my way once I got in with my, with my tools, as he called them, you know, my writing tools. So yes, indeed, man, he was the one. It wasn't a, it wasn't a college advisor, none of that. It was him saying if he had the skills, he would be doing it and I should be doing that now. You know, I think this is such an important lesson for people to understand. I, 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 I truly believe God, he's going to give you the, the, the oh, yeah. it's almost like driving on the highway and seeing those signs, right? Yeah. Mr. Cook, by all accounts, should not have been one of those signs for you. It mm -hmm. should have come through your, your college advisor, your counselor, but you have to be exactly. tuned and you have to be open to listening and understanding that sometimes you are being directed and it's going to come from the most you exactly. know, un unexpected source. And I'm so Automatic. happy that you listened, you heard, yep. but most important, you acted. You understood right. that I have to take action. So now, you get over the vibe. Yep. I love the fact that you made a cold call. I love that because people yeah. have to understand <laughs> you got to take your destiny in your own hand. You can't wait for you it have to be it to you. So now you're taking this yep. action. You say to yourself, you know, I, I, I love XXL. I love the source, but my heart is with, with Vibe Magazine. That's where it's always been. Yep. You go ahead, you start making your yep. call. You get in there, you're working for free for how long? For a year, <laughs> from '96 to '97, I never got I never got a check for any of the writing that I did there. Um, and when I got in, I was on the digital team. And back in the night, like you know, '96, the digital team wasn't where you wanted to be. Everybody wanted to be in the print. They wanted their name in print because everybody was grabbing that. The internet was really just starting to break through, and a lot of people didn't have broadband connections so the sites would be big and a lot of photos and it was just really slow but 
if you were able to write a really dope piece, it can get up before the print team could could speak on or have their their stuff come out to the people on the newsstands. So our stories were being referenced by Daily News and all of them because they were on on um on a daily uh frequency. So you could write a piece, they see something in vibe about something that's happening in hip hop, and then you might get quoted. And it was like, whoa, that's when a lot of people started seeing like the power of the internet, you know, rather than waiting a full month until like all the stuff would come out for the mags. So I started to see that switch and was like, yeah, that's gonna be it. That this this whole forum is gonna be it. Especially when um when the first time I really saw the power of it was when Tupac was killed. And, uh, you know, the unfortunate events made all of us, you know, start typing right away that was on the digital team. And then when you really saw the impact was when Biggie passed and he when he was killed and we jumped right on. Like we went to the, it was on, like it was a Saturday night going into a Sunday morning. We all jumped over to to the office and we just started working. And I started then saying like, yeah, man, this is gonna be this is gonna be the wave right here. This we got to see the future. Yeah, but people didn't want it because the magazines were making so much money. That printed paper, you know, the ads and, and all the events that were connected to it, they were making so much money. It I would say in the urban space it kind of delayed a little bit. And then probably like around late ninety nine, going into two thousand, you saw the internet uh the internet rush when everybody made websites, everybody, it was websites galore, 360 hip hop. Um, we had our joint that was connected to Puff called hook.com. Yeah, I'm gonna um, get into all of that because it's- Yeah, it's it was crazy. It, yeah, it's man. It's for your story. Can, 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 can I go and I wanna pull one thing yeah. of, of, of what you just said. You, were willing to work for free, number one. Oh yeah, oh yeah. But so many people, they overvalue themselves and right. they swear to death that they want to get into a certain industry, but right. they're either too cool or too valuable to give their time <laughs> for free. So that's number, or, number or, one. Or, or, or too entitled. Or too entitled, 100%. Too entitled, too entitled, too entitled I mean? to give their time for free to a yep. so-called career that, that, that you want to be in. Right. But another thing that I love that you said is that you got in on the digital side. Mm -hmm. People, take yourself back to 96. The digital side was not what it is today. So uh, it was just about getting in where you fit in. You took yes. whatever was available to you. And that's another yep. lesson that I think people need to understand. And especially when they hear the rest of your story and the heights that you've risen to, mm -hmm. you would just you just needed to get it. I don't care how I get it. I don't care if I'm sweeping the floors. If I'm exactly, I need to get in that exactly. Building. I just need to be in. And there was one time, I, like in that whole year, I went from being an intern to starting to kind of like freelance for them but without pay so there was one part when the initial intern group all came in we all came in like around may of 96 and i guess like everybody was going to start going back to school in september of of 96 and that's when everything is happening you got the pop stuff is it's, it's getting it's getting lit and everybody's going back to school my man is about to transition out the job and I'm just there because I got it on my own. I didn't have the deadline. Now, when everybody was leaving, I could have just left and not go back. But I just acted like ain't nothing happened. So I just I just started showing up <laughs> and with my book bag, everything I, after school. I just started showing up still. And they was like, oh, yo, they here, yo, they do that story. I was like, yup, I got it. Don't worry about it, I got it. And just planted myself there to the point where it was just like, well, I guess he's still going because go. nobody, no, I, I was like, you're going to have to tell me that I can't come back here anymore. You're going to have to tell me like, like somebody that's stolen, like the store, you see the picture, don't let him in. <laughs> 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 you was going to have to do that because I was going to keep coming back. And what I did was I endeared myself 
and my services to everybody in there. So once I got in, I would go by everybody and, and introduce myself and let them know like, hey, have you heard the new joint from the Bush Babies? I knew they wouldn't hear certain artists they weren't in tune with because I was a backpack kid. I used to run with the executioners, the DJ crew. So I would hear all this, all this different music, you know, early from the record pools and all that. So I would take that knowledge and go back into the office and talk to certain editors like, yo, you don't know about them? Man, I thought you was on it, man. I thought you was on it. I'll put the pressure on them. So then when it was time for them to know about certain things within that underground realm, they would have to come see me. They would talk to me at least. Yo, Day, did you hear? Next thing you know, they're coming to me asking me if I heard such and such. I so love it was where you're going. Yeah. Hey, I love it. Yeah, man. That's that's how a lot of my relationships started with a lot of the editors up there. Kick, 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 and I, I wanted to move this interview forward, but I got because you just <laughs> so many. Gems. I'm with it. I'm with People it. People don't understand, right? Mm -hmm. Granted, you were at the bottom of the totem pole. All the way. We You're were bottom. You're not even bottom, bottom. Heck yeah. <laughs> but nope. where you found you could bring value to the company was number yeah. one, I'm going to always be here. When y'all yeah. look up, I'm going to be here. If yeah, you need to do anything, I don't care if you have an assistant already, look up, say day one, I'm right here. You're going to have to get me out this building. But yep. more important, you brought a value that I'm not even sure. Well, maybe, yes, it, maybe it was conscious on your end. Although you were not writing at that time and you were not intricate into this system yet, you had your ear to the ground. Yes, indeed. With everything that this magazine represented. Yep. So the fact that you could tell them what groups were next, who was hot and they should keep their eye out for. That mm -hmm. is invaluable to somebody who's now a VP, who's editor in chief, somebody who's too busy to, yes. to really sit and listen and be part of the day to day of what's going on in the streets, in the barbershops, in the hood. You exactly. Agree? That is that's so exactly an important piece that you just mentioned. Yep, that was that was my role, and I was in the barbershops all the time back then, just making sure like I'm hearing new stuff. Or I'm at, I'm at the events early while everybody's doing sound checks and stuff like that. I would just find ways to be um, just a cultural, like you said, a, a, a cultural curator. But at the time, I just wanted to absorb all of that. I wanted to absorb it and then bring it back, back out to the people. And even though I didn't have a big writing position, I gave that information to the people that did. And it's like, yo, Here's the information. Do what you will with it. I'm just letting you know I'm a resource for you. If you see me around here, I got you. If I know about it, I'm going to let you know. You know, and, and that's how you I become valuable it. to people. Yep. I love it because, you know, there's somebody right now who is sitting and they're keeping their mouth shut and they're just looking at like, you know, I, I, I come into work, but I'm just an assistant. I'm just a coordinator. And in your head, you're putting yourself in a box and you don't yep. realize you probably possess skills or you have some mm -hmm. information or you could bring value to that company that would have the, the upper echelon of the company take notice, know your name and, and start to say, we need him or we need her in these. Automatic. That, that's Automatic. an important um, piece that you just dropped. Yeah, Sean. And, and, and when I think about now, after having my career and getting all these like, big titles and stuff like that. When I think about the people on my staff that have helped me, yes, I pay them to help me. Like we, we, you know, this is your job and they love what they do. Cool. You're supposed to. The interns, I always would have interns in our meetings outside of like other editors who wouldn't. They'd be like, oh, nah, they don't need to be in here. This is confidential. If it's a content play and it's nothing that's dealing with numbers and business and all that, cool. But if it's a content play, I want the young kids in there. Yeah. Where they at? Come on in, y'all. Yo, did you hear what they said? What you think of that? Who y'all rocking? Who who are your friends messing with? Not even you. Who are your friends talking, telling you about? How are you finding these things out? I would always include them because I remember when that was me, and I remember I would know what was hot. I'm I'm in my forties now. I'm not gonna know exactly everything that's going on. You know what I'm saying? So I would love 
when the the interns would come in and if they especially if they would speak up cuz a lot of times that's a that's a that's a funny position to be in you know you don't want to overstep no nah, you also want to include closed mouth don't get fed and i'm going to tell really. you when i was interning <laughs> yep. i understood this if I believed in something, I was jumping on tables. Y'all yep. need to be doing this. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, understand something. When, 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 I was, when I was at the bottom of the barrel, I knew yes. I knew what I knew. And it's important sometimes you got to, you, even at the risk of being wrong or even at the risk yep. of putting yourself out there, that's got what to. you have to do. Got you know, to. a closed mouth do not get fed. And, and and the one thing that I learned, too, that really helps is putting yourself out there and being wrong. Because then when you're wrong, you get to understand the process of what they like, the process of how to bounce back from being wrong or your idea of being shot down. You got to learn that process, too, because no matter how much you, you do that's dope, there's going to be a time when what you bring to the table isn't dope. Yep. How, do you, how, do you, how do you come back from that? How, how do you now go and reconfigure the idea and or go in another direction and, and so-called redeem yourself or make, that, make that, that hump over to success with a successful idea? Failing is just as important as being successful because then that's where you find like where your heart is. Stop, stop there for one second. Can you repeat that? Just, just, <laughs> just if, if you are watching this, if you are listening to this on podcast, we are doing the... <laughs> bring that back. Daytuan, please, say yes, that indeed. again. Yo, failure is just as important as success because that's where you're going to find out where your heart is. You're going to find out if this is the thing that you really want to do. Do you want it bad enough to go back into the ring after you just got beat up that last round and try to come back and be harder with a doper idea or a new perspective or a new direction? That's why it's important to fail. Because like, before, you know, like now one of the hot terms is fail fast and fail often. Yes, we get that. But people don't want to do that because they feel as though when they fail, that puts them so far behind success. But what it does is it gives you valuable information so you know not to go down that there road anymore. So now I know that's not the way to go. The success path opens up a little bit wider because now you have a destination and options. And, 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 and this is coming from the editor-in-chief at Vibe Magazine right now. Now, yes, indeed. Uh, we, we, we spoke about your interning. Mm -hmm. I'm going to look down at my notes because I want to get this right because yes, let's go. everybody to understand who I am speaking to right now. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You start out it. at Five Magazine, head on over to XXL. From XXL, you go and you work, and we're going to talk about this, with, yep. with Sean Diddy Combs at Hook.com. From Hook.com, yep. you start the, you, you didn't inherit a, a, a magazine. You start King Magazine. Right. Yep. Rides Magazine, Hip Hop yep. Soul. Then you go to work with, with Russell Simmons, yep. another icon in, in, in fashion, in hip hop, in music, in culture, over at yep. Global Grind. Back to Vibe, somewhere in there, I know I forgot, yep. um, Respect Magazine. <laughs> I have Respect in there, too. You've had wow. one hell of a ride. Like, like <laughs> and wow, that's why man. I asked you earlier, did you know it was going to be this big when you started? Because now, now you have the title and you've had the title of editor in chief for so many of these different magazines and, and, mm -hmm. and publications and dot coms that I just mentioned. Right. You did like this is one hell of a ride. It really is, man. <laughs> it really is. When I think about it in total, um, or like when someone asks me, like, yo, do you know such and such? I'm like, oh, yeah, that's my man. Or do you know such and such? Oh, yeah, that's my homie. That's why, oh, yeah, I worked with her before. And it's like, wow, man. Like, And it's also wow because it wasn't like fleeting moments. I had like years with different different brands, you know, where I was able to make my imprint and, and um, at intricate points within each brand. You know, Double XL, I was there, you know, at the beginning from the first issue and then so you when, were there from day one 
from like almost day one. It was like they started they started putting it together like early ninety seven. Mm-hmm. And then they had the preview issue. I was there before they I was there when they finished the preview issue and they were they didn't even send it out yet. That's what, when what I had you my go with as? What was your position? Uh, when I first went that first issue, I was a freelancer. That was like my first check. That was my first Reginald Dennis and all of those guys that put double XL together. It's the uh Jay-Z. It's a split cover with Jay-Z on the on the cover with a cigar and Master P on the other cover. And I did I did three music reviews and a feature on um, enhanced CDs because they were like the new thing. You would you would buy like say uh, Exhibit or Mob Deep from Loud, uh, Loud Records. You get the CD. You could play it in your in your CD player. But then if you put it in your computer drive, um, your CD player, you can click on a little button and it will take you to their website. Yep. So I started ranking all the um, artists that was that that were like forward thinking during that time doing that. And man, oh man, when I got that first check, I just knew I was like, yeah, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm doing this right here. <laughs> I, and at the time, I didn't even have a bank account. I had to go ch- cash it out, check cash and <laughs> <laughs> old school style. That's how crazy it was, man. But I was so excited, and and I just knew that this was the start of something big. I love that you said you didn't even have a check a, 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 a bank account because it just again establishes you didn't come from a means you didn't come from mm-hmm. wealth. you you came from Brooklyn like like from Brooklyn just man. like so many I mean and there are Brooklyn USA's all across America they are low yep. income poverty ridden neighborhoods and the fact that you can rise out of those circumstances and become what you've become, I love the fact that, that you, you know, even without thinking about it, yeah, I didn't have banking. I went to a check cashing place because that's still yep. some people are cashing their checks to this day. To this day, man, to this day. And, and when I go back and I think about those times and what I learned, what, what ends up happening as a journalist, most journalists, I, I don't know how much they'll, they'll talk about it. When you go and you interview these big time rap stars and big black executive dudes and they're they're talking to you about business, you start to soak that up. As much as you're taking it out to the people, you're starting to soak it up too. So now you're starting to get a lot more entrepreneurial because you're talking to people that are getting information and that are setting like businesses into the millions and billions. You start looking around like, okay, some of this information I can store for myself. That's and right. start to start to move around. So now, yes, you're starting to invest. You're starting to get your your bank account stuff. You're starting to look at you know uh, housing um, developments and things of that nature, man. Like it does give you a certain kind of education that you wouldn't get through school because you're dealing with people that are dealing in big business. And my major thing was I'm going to learn from that, and then I'm also going to put that out there for the people to learn from as well. Beautiful, beautiful. Sticking to double XL. Yeah. Obviously, you get to work under some of the greats. Um, Elliot Wilson is there at that time, correct? Oh, this is so crazy. So when I got at Double XL in '97, um, so I worked from the first issue on to about the end of '99, and that's when we do like the Great Day in Harlem with all like. Hold on, we gonna get there because you're part of so <laughs> much history. Crazy man, it's crazy. So we do all of that stuff, and then. That's when the internet stuff started coming through, like all the different brands. And then Elliot, I think he had left um, either Ego Trip or The Source. I can't remember. I think he left The Source at, at the time. And then they hired him as the new editor in chief. I ended up leaving when he was coming. And we spoke real quick, but the opportunity to work in a, in a company that was connected to Diddy was just too big for me. I was like, I got to do this. Mm-hmm. And I left Double XL in '99 to go work on Hook.com. Got you. Um, I, I, you, you, you alluded to it. I think I think it's important just for a cultural bit of the conversation. Mm-hmm. You are involved in two extremely uh, important cultural moments in hip hop. Number yep. one, Great Day in Harlem cover. Wow. Also. I guess what's commonly known as the XXL um, the freshman. freshman. 
Yeah. Can you talk to us about both and how those two, well. what, first off, what was the experience like and, and how they even came to fruition? Are these um, yeah, man. You know, just things that you worked on or were they part of your brainchild? So the um, Great Day in Harlem, which is to me um, one of the greatest magazine covers ever. I don't care what genre. To be but able to get... Who does not know what it is, please describe to him. What oh. is the Great Day in Harlem out, um, magazine cover? So basically that magazine cover was an anniversary and honoring aspect of the cover that came out 30 years prior um, or, or 40 years prior with uh, Art Kane. He took a, 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 a historical jazz group shot with all the greats, Dizzy Gillespie and everybody. They, they all congregated on this uh, monumental photo on 126th Street in front of just, you know, brownstones on that block. And the idea when I got to Double XL in the early days was to recreate that with all the, all the rappers that were out at the time in 98. Um, the idea came up in 97, I believe, um, with, the, with the editorial team. And then when, when I started having say so and I had a position, it was our team like, yo, we're going to get it done. We're going to get it done. And our editor in chief at the time, Sheena Lester, who came from Rap Pages on the West Coast, she was she was like, yo, I'm going to make this happen. This could happen. And when she did her and Leslie Smalls on the PR side and then all of us just calling all out our uh, connections in, in PR teams and labels, over 270 rappers showed up from all over the country, oh man. Oh, my God. And everybody congregated on 126th Street. I'm talking Shaq, uh, Russell Simmons, Andre Harrell, Tribe Called Quest. Uh, Mac 10 and all of them, Naughty by Nature came, and the last person to walk on that block while everybody is in position was Run from Run DMC. It was almost like, it was like you couldn't even write it any better to see 200, over 200 and some rappers screaming, Run! <laughs> thinking they saying Run, but we were saying Run because we was losing the sun. <laughs> so... Just to see him come up on there, he was like, I ain't tripping in front of y'all. Y'all ain't getting me. And everybody cracking up, man. It was like it was like seeing all your superheroes in one place. And all your superheroes are seeing their superheroes. It was just like just me going back to that. It was just one of those moments that was just so monumental and so incredibly dope for the culture. And that was in 98. Um Iconic. Yeah, iconic, iconic moment. And then with um, the freshman issue, I usually, um, I know I came up with the term and I started it where it's currently marketed in that way today. Um, I will say that probably like in 98 or 99, the source, they used to do this thing where they had like the, uh, the next generation and it used to just be like a feature in their mag but in all actuality, one year they had Corrupt, Cameron, I think DMX, Big Pun, Lord, uh, Lord Tariq, and Peter Guns. They had all of them on, on, a, on a holdout cover, and they said Rap's New Generation. Um, when I got to become editor-in-chief of XXL after Elliot Wilson, because once he finished his like, eight-year run, I ended up taking over. I didn't even know I was going to do it. It was just offered to me, and I said no, and then they were like, here's the bag, and I was like, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> I was like, I'll take that. Um, but he had done, a year prior, he had done Leaders of the New School, and he put like 10 different rappers in all white on the cover. And it was a little dark, so you really couldn't see them. But I liked that concept so much because I had already been doing that in King Magazine called Coming Kings where we would tell everybody who was coming out in all different genres, more than music and business and all that. So then I came up with the freshmen and I was like, yo, these are the guys that are ushering in, coming in. And I put B.O.B., Wale, Kid Cudi, um, Blue. Uh, man, there was so many of them, man. Currency. It, hit? it was a hit. Every, every... Every young artist wanted to be on it. The ones that Elliot and, and, and 
the source had done, they were doing artists that were like new but established kind of mm-hmm. in, in a way. Mine was more like here are the breakthrough guys that are coming through. And you got to remember in 08 going into 09, um, you had, it was so dope. You had the explosion of blogs. You had the explosion of, you know, YouTube. You had the explosion of all these different new areas where artists could get their music out outside of just mixtapes. You know, the mixtape game was like really the exposure for like 50 Cent and Cameron and the rest of them. But for Wale and all of those guys and B.O.B. and Asher Roth and uh, Charles Hamilton, it was the internet that was really blowing them up. And that was the difference maker. I wanted to kind of concentrate on the guys that were blowing up there. And that was a little bit early. You know what I love about that cover so much? Mm -hmm. It really gave hope um, to to upcoming artists because you could actually, like I know artists who a year before were grinding, grinding, grinding. And they would be like, yo, I, I want to get on that. I want to get on that freshman cover. And the what next the year, you guys hey, well. saw their grind, you saw their hustle, and put them on the cover. So it was, it was, it was like literally you guys were so in tune to what was next. And it gave these artists hope that that, you know, hey. I could actually make that cover. I, it was so dope, man. And I wish I stayed long enough to do more of them. Mm-hmm. But the team that I I had assembled over there, especially like Vanessa Satin, who was who I inherited, is she um, still over there? I think Vanessa's still she, in. No, Vanessa got there as an intern in '98, as an intern, and she worked nowhere else since '98. She's been there since 1998, just doing it, and she's had a 10 year run with the freshman brand now. And I have to say that her, at the time, my man Rob Markman, it's been so many different iterations of, of, of the crew that's carried that torch for that brand, that that brand is now synonymous with being dope in hip hop. It really is. Um, and it shout was to like, shout yep, to big Rob shout Rob. to Yep, yep. And now he's over at Genius doing incredible things. He's an artist as well, but he's over at Genius just redefining what a journalist can be. A journalist can be someone that promotes and informs the people about new artists, as well as him being an artist himself, which lends more credence to, all right, I understand what you're talking about as an artist because I'm one as well. I just happen to be a really good journalist too. <laughs> Man, he's, a, he's an exceptional journalist. Again, yes, shout to Question for you. Was yep. XXL your first editor in chief position? Uh, no, um, no, nah, it wasn't. It was King. When I when I came, yeah. Well, at, well, actually, it was bugged out. At towards the tail end of Hook, maybe like the last eight to to eight eight to nine months, I was I was changed from executive editor to editor in chief. But that was weird because it was like. You know, the internet bubble was bursting. Puff was just coming off, like, the whole trial and stuff. You know, it was just, like, a turbulent time, man. And all money was just getting snatched away from every internet site you could think of. And everybody was running back to print and running back to, like, their their record label jobs and all that. Um, And this is, like, 2000 going into 2001. But then I was called by the people that put together XXL, and they asked me to come and do the idea I pitched, which was King. And it was like, yo, just come back and do that. Yeah, King Magazine was, I mean, for all guys, it was, oh, man. <laughs> it was, was an amazing magazine. And the fact yeah. that, you know, this was uh, uh, your brainchild, it, yes. it was an idea that you pitched, and you it's not like you inherited this from somebody oh. else. You got to go in and create this to your specific vision. That's a big, you guys you. have had all kinds of people on that cover. Um, oh, if I can man. remember some off the top of my head. One cover in particular yep. with Maya was incredible. Um, that, that was in all the rap songs. <laughs> you had Janet Jackson on that cover, correct? We had, we had Janet Jackson on there. We had Janet. Yo, Janet was a yo. Janet was so dope. 
she actually wanted to do it because you know we have been asking for a while she had wanted to do it when her new her new album was coming out and i'm gonna be real with you janet did the creative direction for that whole joint she was like yo if i do it i gotta do it we yeah. was like you do your thing you do your thing janet yeah. I, well, yeah, I, I, yo, because I remember that cover. If, if I can remember correct, she almost had like business attire with 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 um with a bikini bottom or something. If I remember, yes, indeed, black and white. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Like that one was dope. Tyra Banks was another Tyra one that Banks, worked. Yeah, yep. Super, super hard for her because every year on her birthday, which is December fourth, I'll never forget. I would send her flowers. Um, I had I, I made sure like her team knew that we wanted her on the cover. And I remember when I met with her and her mom, her mom is an incredible photographer, by the way. Um, so when I got all the shots together, I wanted her involved in the process. And me, Tyra Banks, our photo director, we bought the light box so they could look at the shots and everything, because it wasn't digital back then. Um, and her mom, her mom sat with us we was going over the shots. I was like, yo, moms, what you think? Da, da, da. It was such an amazing experience. We did that at their hotel conference room. And um, I think about everything that led up into that moment for me to, to get her was being able to say, and, and the fun, oh, Sean, real quick, real quick. The funny story about that is when we were putting together King and, and looking at the different um, logos for the brand, this is before we even had the, the magazine out. We were like, what's going to be this logo that we're going to put it up? They had, the publishers had a, a placeholder photo from GQ magazine with Tyra Banks on the cover. No and, way. Yeah. And, and instead of GQ, they just used the, um, her photo and they had different logos for King on there. And they spread them out on the floor. And it was like, yo, day one, which one you feeling? And I was like, I'm feeling that one. And they started laughing. Because I was like, yeah, Tyra going to look good under that. That's, that's <laughs> the one. And they started laughing at me in the meeting, like, stop it, man. You'll never get Tyra Banks. Like, like we don't want you to think, like, we want you to go get Tyra Banks. You'll never get her, so don't worry about it. And I was like, oh, really? I was like, all right. And I remember that meeting, and I was just like, I got to get Tyra Banks. And when we finally got her, like, three years later, <laughs> we finally go got her. Was- I went right back to them. I was like, remember that meeting? <laughs> remember that meeting? And, and, yo, that's how I am, man. I just wanted that moment. I wanted them to see that, like, you're not going to put a limit on what we could do and where we can go. Because people will say those type of things to you. And if you're not, if you're not into your own and understanding, like, what kind of power you have, they will keep you here. They will keep you here just from something that little that could have kept me here. But now I have a relationship with Benny Medina and, and Tyra Banks because I didn't allow their limitations to box me in. Oh, I love that so much. I love that so much. Yes, oh, indeed. that is such a gem. And I'm definitely going to be making a segment out of what you just said. <laughs> That's what's up. That's what's up. Question for you. Yo. You have been an editor-in-chief, you've also started these magazines. What's more fulfilling for you, the editor-in-chief? Is it Because I got to believe if you're a writer, if you're a journalist, number one, is that the holy grail position for you to become editor-in-chief of, of a publication? Or is it for you to start your own? I think, oh man, when you, that's really dope, man, because I have like, I have like two sides that I would say. I love the business aspect of the business. Um, being able to say like, hey, here's a whole, here's a whole uh, segment of people that aren't being um, addressed. Let's go after them with this idea and let's formulate this idea. That's very different than, hey, I want to interview you, Sean, and do your story and, and, and deep dive. Those two, those two people usually aren't in the same person. Um, that's like, over here is like more of a publisher role and over here is more of a journalist reporter role. And I'm, I'm, I love being in both spaces. I, and, you and love be, one more than the other? I, I do. And what's funny, the reporter journalist side, when a really dope story is adored by so many people, 
it's you can't you can't you can't really this side of it that's amazing man when people are like yo i felt that line or oh man i didn't even know that like that part of it is so amazing this part is gratifying as well because you're able to do it on a grand scale where a bunch of people are being influenced by an idea and a thought but this right here being in the trenches getting the edits right and all that it's a tedious tedious process but in the end it's so rewarding man okay so let's go there right journalism i'm i I, i'm on the outside i don't even know what that means anymore because it's changed so much over the years right yes but you started as a writer Mm -hmm. now for lack of a better way to put it you manage tons of writers You work yep. with it every day. Mm-hmm. With the ever-changing world of journalism, interviewing what people want versus what, you know, the, the, the establishment wants to get out there, how mm-hmm. do you manage your writers? Like, how do you keep them creative, but also, I guess, have them stick to the integrity of what it is to wow. be a writer? Man, oh man, when when you see everyone that's now, you know, in the space, you, you recognize everyone is able to ask questions and be a journalist, like yourself. Like what you're doing right now, that's what you are. But you have a certain kind of respect for it where you, where you do your research and you're adding certain elements to it. That's what that is. Some people, they just want to know, all right, what's the drama? That's very different in in a journalism state and they don't even know your background they just want to know like what the drama is post that and that's it you know so that's where the you know in in our urban space that's where that whole term gets construed and all bent out of shape as far as managing my writers and and knowing what their capabilities are what I tend to do is I tend to lean towards the people that bring really good ideas or pitches to the table. You can tell a piece is going to be kind of dope by the pitch, the way that the pitch is, is made. And what a pitch is, is basically me saying, hey, Sean, I have an idea about a story. Here's the details. Here's what I think we should talk about. Here's the theme. Here's some of the people that we could reach out to. I think it would be dope to bring it out during this time because it'll be timely because of this. That's your pitch and if someone could make their pitch funny um if they if their pitch can make you feel like oh man this is is gonna be a tearjerker you know who to work with with that then you get the piece now the real work goes down they they they've written it they they went and got their second sources they're putting their quotes in they're getting the research and copy editing now you get to go in and start seeing line by line i don't know if we should say it like this because you say something similar here, let's take this out, bring this here. It's the construct of the building. You want your building to have a strong foundation. You want it to look fly as it goes up and you want it to be sturdy enough and sustainable enough with, within the confines of the building. That's how I, I structure pieces in my head. So when people read them, they have a full experience. Great, <laughs> really great. <laughs> I, 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 I want to stick to to management styles mm-hmm. and in you being able to help the next generation for a, a, a second, right? Yeah. You have alluded um, in this conversation several times about working alongside Diddy at Hook.com, which I'm sure so many people don't remember. But nah, you, so you have that experience working with him. You have that experience working hands-on with Ellie, I mean, excuse me, with, with Russell Simmons. You Definitely. have had great managers yourself. Yep. If, can, can I just pull and extract some of the things maybe you got from uh, 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 Russell Simmons and from mm-hmm. a Diddy and from any other manager that helped you become the manager you are today? Oh, no question. I've learned from all of them. I've learned from people that aren't even as big name as those guys. I would say during my um, Double XL first first run Reginald Dennis who put together double XL with, with his with his homies from the source when they came over he was he was so detail oriented about the stories of 
people and the themes. He wanted to go deep, deep, deep. What else? His thing would be, what else? What else? What's the other side of this, though? What's the other side of that, though? Wait a minute. Who would, weren't they connected? It would be like these little minutia parts of, of stories and hip hop uh, folklore and stuff like that. He wanted to drill down into all of that. And I learned that from him. I learned that if you do those kind of steps, you're going to unearth a really dope story. Um, when we got over to hook.com, there were so many different people that were involved. Like Puff would, would have these meetings over at Bad Boy and it, everyone would be at the table and people are just throwing out ideas. But he was looking at who idea connected with his understanding. And if he didn't understand it, he wanted you to break it down some more. Break that, what that mean? What that mean? What that mean? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That was my experience with him. Um, Keith Klinscales from Vibe. What I saw that he was able to do as publisher, he was able to take um, what what hip hop is and, and what Andre Harrell, that, that level of executive, we're gonna take this culture and explode it. We're gonna take it to the highest of heights. We're gonna take it to Ken. We're gonna take it to St. Bart's. We're gonna take it to these places where we're not supposed to be, but we're gonna expand and extract and put our flavor out there. So he was just like doing, oh, when you think about Bob Music Seminar in 96 and 97, they were doing it at the Waldorf Astoria. They wasn't doing it at, you know, random hip hop nightclub or or the the regular, you know, spot in one of these, at the Waldorf Astoria, five star, you know what I mean? We're going to take it there. And it was about the elevation back then. I've learned so much from that. I'm even so from, happy you mentioned Keith Clink Scales. Because yeah, man. what he did at Vibe and what he showed this culture could be, like what could be done from, yeah. from a journalistic and, and, and integrity point of view, really not just focusing on the music, but focusing on the culture as a whole. Yeah, I'm so happy you mentioned him. Yo, man, he, he was just... Even to this day, we still have our conversations. Um, he always throws up the fact that I was a young kid. Like, I used to go sit in his office and mess with him as an intern at Vibe. Man, I think about them times, and now I have, like, these real dope business calls with him. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing. I, I would also say some of the creative aspects I learned from my man Don Morris and Evan Gubernick, they showed me how to take words that we write as editors and make them look pretty and kind of visualize where they would be on the page and what words made emphasis, what colors would, could help with your, with your photos, how photos can tell the story better and enhance your words. It was so many people, man, I, I, I'm just so indebted to. Uh, you, again, we, we've had this, this incredible conversation, so much stuff that I prepared for, but so much more that you wow, enlightened Thank me you. on. Um, and I didn't know about parts of your story and the way you think and how it's all come together for you. I got a question before we close out. Yep. What's the most fun you've wow. had? In, like, you, you've been doing this now for 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. uh, at least 15 of them on an extremely high level. What's the that. most fun that you've had in where was it? Because we just mentioned so many different magazines um, right. that you worked at. Wow, man. Back over your career. Where are you saying, even if I didn't realize it at the time, this is the place that, that it all came together for me. I just had a ball. Yeah. Wow, man. I would have to say um, Hook.com, surprisingly, was, was a lot of fun because that was the first time we were able to bring all of our friends together and work together. Even though we were interns at Vibe, we weren't necessarily calling shots back then. We couldn't say we want to do X, Y, and Z only. At Hook, we were able to try any and everything that we wanted to do, man. It was so dope to be able to say, yo, I'm gonna hire my man. We're gonna have this whole crew. We're all gonna learn. They're gonna. They, that was basically. I think about Brett Wright and Peter Griffith and all of them that was controlling, um, you know, the business. And they were like, "Yo, here, y'all go do what y'all do. Just, just do something. Make it work." 
and we were just coming up with these ideas. One of the and this was what was so fun about Hook, and then the other one was King. But real quick with Hook, <clears throat> excuse me. There was one time we were trying to come up with like something super dope. We were like, why aren't the artists doing the versions of songs for videos that were like filler, filler tracks? You know what I'm saying? They weren't the singles. We wanted to do videos for the songs that everybody wanted videos for. And we just started reaching out to artists. We did, little. one of my favorite was Little C's Chicken Head. And we went, we got Little C's. He, he, he did, we, we got a little box. We had the video do, and we went all over Harlem, like doing on 125th Street, doing a video, made a video for Chicken Heads. There's no video for it, but we made it. You know what I'm saying? That was fun, man. We were just having fun with ideas. And then when I stepped it up a notch is when we went over to King and I started King and I just started building my team. And we just went after the industry and we, yo, man, we dominated for so many years. And I loved it because I was doing it with people I really cared about and was able to build the kind of team that I always wanted. And um, it was a lot of fun, man. When we, we were just talking about that recent, the whole team got together for my birthday um, this weekend on Zoom, actually. We had a Zoom party for my birthday, the, the old staff. We had a ball for two hours. <laughs> That's nice, man. That's nice. Thank you, man, for that. Couple more questions for you. But yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready. I know I am a victim of this. Uh -huh. um, and I say this because there's somebody right now who is, they're dreaming. Maybe, maybe yep. they have made their way into whatever, you know, industry that they want to be into. Um, right. But they're still on the bottom and they're dreaming. Mm -hmm. I know for me, when I finally made it in to the game, um, into music, I was on a mission. Like I was, I was trying to outwork the competition. I was just, I was laser focused. All the way. But in the interim, I miss so much of it. And mm. one of the things that are, is the biggest regrets of my career is missing the moment. It's the journey. Because the wow. destination is great. It is, that but... This journey, this thing goes by quick, man. It does. For oh, my you, goodness. It's so you crazy you said that. Any advice to anybody who is listening, who's dreaming about one day sitting in your seat, can you please talk to them about the importance of oh, living in the moment and really appreciating the journey? Oh, my goodness. We were just talking about that as a crew. Once again, like I was saying, my King crew got together, my Vibe group, uh, crew got together, my boys, we all got together. I had all these different Zoom parties for my birthday last week. And what we were talking about was, are we going to get those moments back because of the current situation we're in in this pandemic? Will there ever be a time where all of us can get together carefree, carefree minds about what we're enjoying? Not, dag, I'm having fun, but am I going to catch something? Mm -hmm. You know, are we going to go into that mode now? And if we knew that we would be in something like this, would we um, cherish those moments even more? And we were talking about like how the journey is where the fun happens. You get to the destination, that's the celebration, which is dope. And, and hopefully you get there. But the fun is in the journey, man. The hard, the hardships, the stuff you overcome. And that was one of the conversations that we were having about all the different things that we overcame to become successful with all those different brands. That's where you got to see, once again, that's where you got to see the merit of your friendships, how you can get over grudges, how you celebrate together, how you become family. That's going to be part of your story when you when you're dreaming that you don't think about. You're dreaming about that destination, but you don't see everything that goes into that. And there's so many mixed emotions that happen. The thing is, are you happy when you get to that destination? Because you could be miserable at that destination if you don't enjoy the journey. Yeah, I, I mean, for anybody who's watching, I second everything that you just said, Juan. <laughs> I, I, I truly, in Appreciate my heart of hearts, like, believe the, the 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 destination that that's the that's the you can pop and just truth be told 
is there ever really a destination? Because when you get there, you're always looking at the next one and the you're next. Like, but it's the journey. It's it's yeah. that, that road that you travel, the ups, the downs. It's it's the setbacks, the failures. Oh man! The small successes, not the big successes. Not the big ones. Your not case, the big ones. The small looking ones. back at a Mr. Cook who couldn't read, but he told you what you needed to hear to get you started. Yep. These are all the little pieces that, that that's the goal that you so so if you are just starting your career out, please if you don't remember nothing else in this conversation, live in the moment, document it if you can, but For enjoy real. that ride. Yes, indeed, man. And that's another thing you that that you mentioned just now. Try to document it as much as you can. Um, that's one thing that I wish I did more of. You know, especially being a writer and everything. I remember my man, Sidney Marguson, who's a um, PR director over at Atlantic Records. Long time, over 20-year friend. At the beginning of my run at King, he was like, yo, day, man, start writing all this stuff down. And I did at the beginning. And during the quarantine, I found the notes that where I started. And I was so mad at myself because I had stopped after a few pages. And I was like, what was I going to write? Right there. I wish I knew what I was going to write next because I, it took me into a time machine where I was like talking about enjoying this whole new endeavor that I was on. And I have other notes here and there, but I wish I would have kept going because I know what I would put now, but I wish the 26 year old day would have said how he felt at 26, not 45. There you you go. know what I mean? So if, if anything, man, please, all y'all, y'all just start to document your journey. Y'all be surprised five and 10 and 15 years later how you felt back then. Dayton, it's been a pleasure. It's been my pleasure. I'm sure our oh, audience man. is going to get so much out of this conversation. If people are trying to reach you, if they're trying to yes. follow you, where can they follow you at on social media? On social, I'm Day Dog on Twitter. That's D A Y D O G. And on Instagram, it's just my first name, Daytuan, D-A-T-W-O-N. I know that's not the normal way. Usually somebody has, like, both of them the same. But I love my day dog on Twitter, man. <laughs> but, uh, man, yeah, that's, that's me on, on, on social, man. Y'all, y'all hit me up. Daytuan, thank you so much. You are a true power move maker. You have dropped it, so many gems, so many words of wisdom, and you have been so inspiring to myself and I'm sure my audience is going to be so inspired by hear, hearing your story. Thanks Thank again. Thank you so much, man. Continue, like, <laughs> please, continued success, blessings, and staying healthy. We'll Same to you, fam. Peace. Yep. Peace. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.